We have with us Dr. Carmencita David Padilla, Professor of Pediatrics at the College of Medicine and currently Chancellor of the University of the Philippines, Manila. Dr. Padilla is a pioneer in genetics in the Philippines and the Asia-Pacific region. Chancellor Padilla is also a distinguished academician of the National Academy of Science and Technology. She is a multi-awarded and her well-known awards include the Robert Guthrie Award by the International Society of Neonatal Screening, the Outstanding Professional of the Year Award in the field of medicine by the Professional Regulation Commission, including the Eric Nubla Award, the most distinguished alumnus of the UP College of Medicine in 2016, and the Outstanding Young Men Awardee for Medicine in 1994. Chancellor Padilla, tell us your story. Why did you go into medicine? Um, when I was young, I, was, uh, I frequented the office of my aunt who was a pediatrician, and she was actually the director at White Cross, I, an orphanage uh, in, uh, close to Pinaglabanan. I actually enjoyed the children, and somehow I, I saw the connection, and uh, maybe I could be somebody like her in the future. But maybe more important than that, my parents felt and they believed that my personality was for a physician. Mm. Was genetics your first choice as, sub, as a subspecialty in pediatrics? No. When, when I got into medicine, I was clear that I wanted to become a pediatrician. When I entered the residence in pediatrics, I wanted to become a neonatologist. And for four years, I prepared myself to become a specialist for very sick babies. But after my chief residency, uh, four mentors actually approached me and told me that they needed a geneticist. And I was actually, actually coerced to move into the field of genetics. It was not an easy decision. I asked for a few weeks to think about it. And uh, you know, with some soul searching, I felt that hey, maybe you know, going through a new field probably wasn't so bad. But um, so I said yes. But I think you know, I belong to a generation wherein we followed what the old people told us. And uh, I did it with a very heavy heart at that time. So can you tell us how you started genetic services in the country? When I was in training, I realized that there were so many services that were needed. I needed a clinic, I needed laboratories, and uh, there were many things that were not present in the Philippines. So when I came back home, I actually informed the dean of the College of Medicine that I needed the following. And the only thing they could offer me at that time was actually one person, and I had to start from scratch. I started really with just a table and a chair. I had uh, 40 boxes of old equipment from my, from my mentor in Australia, and that was the beginning. I uh, set up a clinic at PGH. I got referrals from all over the country. Being the only geneticist at that time, I practically saw patients from the different hospitals within Metro Manila. So starting genetics in the College of Medicine on, in UP, UP Manila was not really that easy at the time. That was the time when genetics was not so popular. Genetics was looked at as a very academic field and uh, it was not really for the ordinary person at that particular time. Mm -hmm. um, newborn screening is considered to be one of the most successful population-based genetic screening program in the country. Can you, uh, you know, it's a story that's all of you, I think. So well, can you share with us the, it's the triumphs, the failures of this program, how you dealt with the challenges of uh, institutionalizing a huge program for the country? When I was in training, newborn screening was just a very small rotation in my, in my training. And uh, right after my training, my mentor in, uh, in Australia actually requested me to join a conference wherein everybody in the audience were running already a program newborn screening, whereas I was the only one. The father of newborn screening, Dr. Guthrie, uh, upon knowing that I was the only one in the audience who had no newborn screening program, requested me to stay next to him. And he told me that when he was trying to set it up 40 years earlier, nobody wanted it, nobody believed him, and there was not even a single journal who wanted to, to actually publish his paper. 
But he actually told me that uh, it is good for the babies, it's good for the country, it's good for the world, and, uh, but we should not give up. And because of that, when I came back to the Philippines, I started discussing this with my mentor who wanted to set up newborn screening 17 years earlier. And this is actually Dr. Carmelita Domingo. Dr. Carmelita Domingo came home to the Philippines 17 years earlier, and she never succeeded in setting it up in the country. So together, we set it up. Newborn screening is um, really started out as a research. My, my goal at the beginning was just to offer the data to government because I knew that without the data, uh, they could not adopt it. So actually, newborn screening started out as a simple research, getting the data in the Philippines to show that it was important for the babies. But um, when we finished the research, the government was not ready. And despite many visits to the Department of Health, they told me that the problems were too difficult to solve. Uh, it was too difficult to implement and that um, I needed legislation. And because of that, I decided at one point in my life, I had to enroll and take a, uh, a Master of Arts in Health Policy Studies so that I could learn the skill of writing the law. Well, of course, by this time, the program was expanding uh, without legislation, but not enough to reach every baby in the country. And uh, well, of course, you know, I, I learned this, the skill. Writing the law is easy, actually, if you know what you want. Uh, by the time I had the law passed in less than a year, which was a miracle even at that point, the harder part was implementing it. So, um, because now it's, it's actually found and being implemented in every hospital, each of the 7,000 hospitals in the country and birthing center in the country is offering newborn screening. And I think that is the reason why they say that I will be remembered for newborn screening. Yes, you are called the mother of newborn screening in the Philippines. And uh, can you share with us how you're also helping the other Asian countries set up their newborn screening programs? Well, it, it has its own challenges. It didn't happen overnight. And it's actually, it's, uh, it's not yet over. Because um, when you talk about the newborn screening program, you're not, you're not just talking about setting up the, new, the, the lab for, for the babies. You have to work on the financing part. Uh, we got PhilHealth to, to pay for the fee. We had to look into the follow-up. And then now we're setting up genetic centers in the country. But I think the model of um, starting from nothing became attractive to a lot of the, uh, 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 the lower and middle income countries that it is actually possible to set up a program with no support at all from the very beginning. But I, I tell all of my colleagues in the region, so I have about 12 countries now who are actually uh, uh, you know, trying to find out just exactly how we did it. I tell them at the beginning they need first a leader to, to put it forward because I think you need a national leader. A leader, it doesn't have to be a national leader, but you need a, a person who believes in the program, who is going to go through all of the problems uh, regardless of what happens. Chancellor Padilla, can you uh, tell us more about the challenges that you encountered setting up newborn screening for the whole country as well as like... Uh, you know, pushing it to become a law? Well, in the first place, I never expected that I will be doing it for the whole country. I wanted to do the data, and I wanted to give it to the Department of Health. But by the time we had the data, they were not ready to adopt it. The implementation on a national scale was too complex for them. And most of the problems that I presented could not be uh, answered by the, the rules that they had at the Department of Health. After three years of meetings with them, uh, one assistant secretary told me I needed legislation. That was the time when I went back to school. I decided that I couldn't afford the consultants at the time, and it was cheaper for me to just go back to school. And I did a, a Master of Arts in Health Policy Studies, and I learned the skills of what should be said and what should not be done. And um, when I was writing the, the bill, um, it's not a long bill, but it addressed each of my problems 
in the implementation of the program. Number one, how do you make hospitals follow you? I am just an ordinary faculty member of the College of Medicine. Well, you solved it. It's a, it's a requirement for licensing. A hospital or a birthing center will not be licensed to operate unless they have newborn screening as a service in their hospital. How do you get paid? That was my problem. You know, even if the parents paid, the hospitals did not pay us. So that was another thing we put in the law that I, I wrote there that it's going to be part of the newborn care package. So in other words, if you look at the law now, it's really, a very, sh it's really very short, but it addresses each of the problems I encountered in the seven years that I was setting up the program. But I'm not alone. I had 24 hospitals who set it up, and I have to give credit to the 20, 24 hospitals who told me that they will join me in this crusade. And these were very senior people until we get it done uh, at the national scale. Now, now that I had the bill, I had a conversation with the health secretary, and this was an interesting story because he said, why are you pushing for legislation? And I told him, if you can get it to become a program in the country before I get it passed as a bill, I'll be happy. But the, mis the mystery there and the miracle there is that this law got passed in less than a year, and I think that's providential at this point. I cannot take full credit for that. Um, it's a, um, I think, you know, it was time. There was nothing wrong with the bill. It meant saving babies. And uh, I had enough publications to show to government that um, if this, was, this became a program of the country, it could save the government actually hundreds of millions because these children who were saved will be taxpayers of the future. So th that was just at the beginning, but you know, when finally it was passed as a law, there were still hospitals who did not participate. So I had to work very closely with the Department of Health on how I was going to get these hospitals to, to follow the law. So I think, you know, as um, my lesson there is that if you believe in something and you've reached the point that you moved it from a project to a policy, you have to hold hands with your implementing agency. And this particular one, my partner really is the Department of Health. I really, I really take a back seat. Uh, the lead agency is the Department of Health, but I, they know that you know, we will be there. We at UP will be technical consultants, but at the end of the day, it's going to be the hospital. I think you know, uh, the biggest challenge is looking at the, the coverage in the country, and it's not yet 100% up to now. But uh, there was something that the law uh, had that I think helped me a lot. And this is something I'd like to share. When I, was, when I, gave, my first, when my, when I gave my working draft to the Senate, they told me that it is such a good project, but you need to create an office in UP. And you know, I, I said, my God, I don't think I want to do this for life. Mm -hmm. But they said, it's going to die. You have to create an office within the university that will serve as a technical uh, support for the, for, the, for, the, for the project. When I went to the lower house, I had exactly the same comment. They said, this is such a good bill, and if it's passed without a, an office in the university to, to help the government, it's not going to work. So I had to sit back and ask myself, how far am I willing to go with this? Project. It was just a project. I had many other projects. This is, people think it's a full-time job. It's not even my full-time job. I, it, it, came, it reached the point, it was really an advocacy at, at that point. You know. But I had to ask myself, will I take on the challenge or not? Because I knew that if I created an office in the university, then I will be stuck with the program until I retire and beyond. And after some soul searching, again, I said, okay, I'll do it. So I, in the law, it says that there will be a newborn screen, screening reference center that will be created in the university that will serve as a technical arm of the, of the project. But people thought it will take me 10 years to get it passed. Nobody expected me to get it passed in less than a year. And um, well, I thought it will take 10 years because that was, that was what then Senator Flavier told me. He told me, it takes me 10 years to make a law. 
And I told him, I will wait. And of course, you know, when it got passed in less than a year, it was big news at the Department of Health because there was one health bill that got passed in less than a year. So I have to give credit to a lot of people now because it's not just me. I think I'm just a, the face. I, am, I may be the leader of the group, but I could not have done this with all the people who were supporting me at the time, the midwives, the nurses, the doctors, the societies who said we will support this because we believe that it's a good project for the Philippines. So because of the law, and it's now 24 years old, do I still have challenges? Oh, many. I don't think the challenges will ever stop. So since I have the office now, uh, which I work very closely with, every year we evaluate the program. Every year we look at the project. It's really a program. I don't call it a project anymore. But what are our challenges beyond now? So I have a long list of things to do actually for the next couple of years that all pertains to newborn screening. What is your vision for newborn screening 10, 20 years from now? Well, I'm hoping it's, uh, it will happen before I leave this world. We're not at 100%. We're just about 80%. I'm still losing some babies who are not being offered screening. And um, right now, you know, we have an office, which is about 20, that oversees the whole program. I have seven labs in the country that's offering the service. We have two million babies a year. So I had this formula on how can we bring down the cost and still make it accessible. So that was something that I really studied before I got into this. It's, it's, it's really affordable at this point. We have uh, 14 clinics now around the country. And uh, we've got all regional offices with the coordinator. And something that's new and that's going to happen in the next couple of months is that because of the number of babies we are saving, and by the way, newborn screening is, sa is about saving babies. So if we do this, put this in place, then we will be saving thousands of babies down the line. Just just what conditions we're talking about. We're talking about conditions where in, if they're tested at birth, if they are screened at birth, we know whether they will die or will have a certain condition or disease that can be treated from birth. And so far, we've, we have saved more than 100,000 babies right now. So it's, a, it's not really for me to continue. What I'm doing right now is making sure that I have a group who will continue this work beyond my term and beyond my life. If I look at the story of the successful countries, the people who started it, like Dr. Guthrie, is still alive even way past his, uh, way past his life. So looking down the line, I'm really looking at being a implemented throughout the country beyond the lives of everybody who's supporting it right now. Newborn screening, the newborn screening law has a twin legislation, and that's the Rare Disease Act. Can you uh, tell us how you actually yes. pushed for yes. this uh, act as well? You know, when I was implementing, uh, when I was eventually implementing the newborn screening law, I saw the gaps in that law. And newborn screening law talks about screening the baby. I had a lot of problems finding treatment for the babies we were picking up. It was a struggle. Um, the problem with geneticists is that when you find the patient, you have to find the treatment. Not all treatment is really cheap. Some are more expensive. So um, following the model again in other countries, I, you know, I prepared legislation that uh, I prepared the bill that will respond to all my problems, which covers from treatment to education and to uh, employment. That law took me eight years. That was difficult because uh, each time, and I, I don't understand why it took so long. I think it's because uh, treatment was expensive. I think that's one, because in the other one, the treatment was cheaper. I had a different set of struggles with my second legislation. But when I reached the point when I told myself that I had to change my, my uh, uh, you, you know, you need to get somebody at the Senate who will, who will fight for you. I had to change my strategy. 
And of course, I have to give, give credit to Senator Pia Cayetano, who really helped me push that law to the very end because that was a difficult bill to pass. But of course, you know, it has been passed and we're also implementing it right now. Chancellor, you have more than 120 uh, publications in the form of textbooks, uh, uh, original articles, monographs. You definitely are one person who recognizes the role of research in, academic, in an academic institution. How significant is research for an institution's sustainability and development as well as knowledge-driven innovations? Um, I just want to focus on UP. And I believe that uh, as a university, and we claim to be a research university, it really is the source of new ideas. So I think you know, the primary responsibility of the university is to generate new knowledge. Because the new knowledge is important to, if you want to help in, this, in the problem solving in the country, then we have to come up with new ideas that's actually solving old problems. So, these ideas will have to be cultivated. These ideas will have to be um, put in the right environment so that faculty will feel good about generating new ideas and that ideas will not end. Which means that if an idea is not even published at a certain point, government, other faculty members, other universities will not benefit from the value of that new knowledge. So I, early on, I, um, one thing I learned from my mentor, and in, in particular, I'll give, I'll, I'll cite former Chancellor Perla Santos Ocampo. She was probably one person who also had quite a huge number of publications, and uh, she was very particular about getting data into the print. Okay. And I think, you know, as a faculty member, it's something that I imbibe and that it became part of my life. And I think that is something that young faculty have to remember that if it becomes part of your life, then it will not be so difficult. So even up to now, I, I continue to publish because I still have some ideas that I want to share. And uh, if I don't write these ideas, then nobody will ever find out that it's a possible solution to a future problem of the country. So uh, you've stayed in the university for how long now? Oh, uh, maybe, 40, maybe four decades, I, I don't know. Uh, I've been in UP since 1973 as a student, then going on to medicine, and then I've stayed on. I've stayed on in the university. So you know that uh, being in the university is very fulfilling for the heart, but not so much for the pocket. Um, you know, if you're a doctor, uh, clinical practice can be more attractive because of the uh, monetary gains. But you chose to stay as a public servant in the university. Um, I think um, it, it, it's something that's, it, it, that, that one is difficult to explain because, of course, you know, I had options when I came back. But I have to go back to my rearing, wherein we were made to believe that uh, money is not everything. So you know, it's really it's hard to say exactly why I did it. You know, I still sometimes when my son asks me why, and I try to grope for answers, and it's something you want. And I I, I hope that the younger generation will see that it's not all money that ma that matters, but. UP has given me the environment for my ideas. You know, I think if I look at what UP has given me, it allowed me to cultivate my ideas um, because my ideas were not the ordinary. My ideas were different. My ideas were new. If I knew that if I went to the private sector, I had to follow somebody else. Well, in UP, we all know that it provides you the leeway, the elbow room to do what you want. And I think I enjoy that. So I think you know, it's very important to, to enjoy what you're doing. I, I enjoyed what I was doing. I think that's what's important now because if you enjoy what you're doing, then you start putting the balance, on, you know, the balance in life. Why did you choose to become a chancellor of UP Manila? Oh, okay. Well, you know, this is interesting. I don't think I've shared this with a lot of people. More than a decade ago, people kept telling me that I was going to be a chancellor of the future, even 20 or 30 years ago. And I said, 
Is that even part of my plan? You know, I just wanted to be an ordinary faculty member. But you know, at a certain point when I started holding administrative positions, because I've had so many positions already in administration, I saw that there were I could still offer more by becoming a chancellor. And I, I saw the gaps and I, I wanted to fill in those gaps. And I wanted I wanted to help, I think you know that's it. I wanted to help the future generation of faculty members because uh, if I had that kind of environment, I think from a decade earlier, maybe I could have been more productive. So what, are, what do you think are your concrete projects that helped you accomplish your vision for UP Manila when you became a chancellor? Well, I, of course I had many dreams and I, I know that life is too short. And I was trying to reflect on um, which of my, which of my projects or which of my accomplishments would probably give value most, because actually, of course, all of them are important, you know. In the first place, I wanted to be as inclusive as possible. I, I, being a doctor, you know, I didn't want to favor only medicine. I wanted to make sure that all of my colleges, all the colleges were my children, and they will feel that I am their mother. But you know, at the end of the day, when I was trying to reflect, there are two things, you know, if I, if I look at it. Well, number one is, I saw there was a lot more we could do in the field of research. I wanted to move forward to a time when research can be a career, because that, is not, that does not exist in the country. In the US, you can survive as a researcher, not in the Philippines. But I saw the, I saw the, the difference that I cannot say that you can be a, only a researcher. So my, my bargain now to the faculty is, I want them a balanced life of academics and research. But I have to create the environment so that they will not be threatened to become a researcher. And that is tough because I, being a researcher for decades, I knew exactly where the problem was. So before I go back to research, before I forget, the other one is I wanted the green campus. You know, I, I don't understand you know, why Manila looks so drab, you know, and whereas Diliman had the greens, Los Banos had the green. So I told myself that in my, in my term, I will create an environment wherein we will have the greenery in UP Manila. And that's the reason why I started having the high-rising buildings, because the only way for Manila, UP Manila to expand is to start building the high-rise and then uh, open the spaces for the garden. And I think we're going to have it before the end of the year, wherein we will have a green campus, and my goal is a walking campus, and UP Manila is uh, small enough to achieve that. It may be difficult in other uh, constituent universities, but UP Manila, uh, I think you know, it's possible that five years down the line we will have a walking campus. So going back to research now, these are the things that I felt were important for me. If I were to come up with another generation of researchers, number one, Yes, we have the Research Ethics Board, and I take pride in our Research Ethics Board because um, it has been, just been awarded as the most outstanding ethics research board in the region. And I think that, that really tells, it, tells us that we're doing it right. And uh, we know that uh, uh, for health research, ethics is very important. That has been there for a while, but I think you know, we've been able to improve. One big problem for researchers is the grants management. Grants management really means helping a researcher from the time that the grant is being, uh, when you're looking for money for the grant, writing the grant, implementing the grant, doing the finances, writing the report, dealing with the, uh, the lawyers, dealing with the funding agency. That was one environment I, I felt that was needed so that I can attract more faculty members to do research. And, um, and of course, you know, when uh, it's one of my main agenda at the beginning was to, to reorganize and um, actually uh, the way you see, see it is that it was there, but then I wanted to make sure that it was responsive to the needs of the researchers. The third thing that I 
I, I felt that was important for uh, the community was that, was to have the research integrity. So the research integrity this time is a very new office is going to be opened up. We want to make sure that our faculty come up with research that, uh, that will test, you know, uh, that are acceptable and uh, not only by the local community but, but the foreign community. But th that's, those are all offices and programs. So my biggest challenge was uh, where will I place the, the researchers if they wanted to do research. And the National Institutes of Health, which really is, uh, is, is not even my original idea. This was the dream of the chancellor in the 1990s. I felt I had the chance to implement it. So although the money actually came in 2012 before my term, I was the one in charge of uh, uh, preparing the building. I felt that if there was a home for the researchers where they can do their work, close to the hospital, then I will be able to encourage more faculty members to research. So I, th that's just some of the things that I feel uh, are important, but having the building, I think, is really providing a home. So that's how I felt when I started. The College of Medicine adopted me. That was my home. The hospital was my home. So researchers without a home will, ha will find difficulty for continuity. They will f have difficulty sustaining their, their ideas and their programs. So I feel that the NIH is going to be the home for the researchers of Manila. But as we are building the 18-story building, I'm running out of space. So right now already I'm discussing where a second building will be constructed. So I think as a chancellor, we, um, we've got, we have to know, we have to get the pulse of the community what do we need? And um, I'd like to believe that I am responding to every pulse that I feel. Um, if I don't have enough time to do it, then hopefully my successors will, will, will continue them. So I, I really look at what is needed by my community. And my community is not just faculty members. I have staff. I have students. I have researchers. I have non-researchers. I think, you know, as a chancellor, we have to know what each group needs, and then we will have to find the solutions for them. But that's the way I look at the chancellor, is looking at uh, how you can make life a lot better and more pleasant for the community that you serve. Did you make a lot of curricular changes during the time of your uh, chancellor, you know, during this time, uh, to make uh, the curriculum of the health science center nationally relevant as well as uh, globally competitive? You know, I believe that uh, uh, academic pro programs must be reviewed regularly. And as a matter of fact, I think every three to five years, it must be reviewed to be relevant to the time. So we've just finished overhauling, reviewing all the undergraduate programs. We're now working on the graduate programs. So now we're working on the graduate programs and we're looking at new programs. So if you look at the current academic, the current graduate programs, I think I finished, last week I sat down and listened to the deans present their upgraded program, uh, maybe developed, you know, they, they had to put in some new things. The other thing is that you've, there are many technologies now, strategies for teaching, it doesn't have to be face-to-face. -face. There's technology that's important, there's blended learning. So I think, you know, we have to know what is important. But I have another 25 programs in the pipeline, um, and only a handful has been completed. So when I asked the deans to tell me what is needed by the community, that was after consultation with the stakeholders, and we were able to identify another 25 new programs that will be implemented by UP Manila. So I think, you know, as a chancellor, that's also another thing that we have to do is, they may be old programs, but they have to be they have to be reviewed. They have to make sure that uh, our graduates are relevant to the employers. I, my challenge actually to my deans is that to be able to say that 99.9% uh, .9 of our graduates are employed by the time they graduate. Because when I visit universities in overseas, especially in Europe, one thing they advertise is the employability of their, of their students, so of their graduates. So yes, there, there are. So there's so much that's happening. It's not only in the undergraduate, but also in the graduate programs. 
Chancellor, so you've talked about teaching, you've talked about research, you've talked about services that UPA Manila uh, has been doing and has, has offered in terms of services. What do you think uh, will be the relevance of, the, of UP Manila to the country in the coming years? Well, health is always going to be a, uh, a priority in the country. And um, health is wealth. So, so long as there is a problem in the area of health, UP Manila will be relevant. I'd like to believe that UP Manila should continue looking at all the problems in health in the country and start generating knowledge so that we can contribute to the, up, to the pool of solutions that we will give to government. Um, let's just, let me just give you an example. We should really start producing our own diagnostic kits to make a diagnosis. I don't think we should be importing our diagnostic kits overseas. But I have a problem in the Philippines. Because even if we have Filipino scientists who are, who are developing the kits locally, our government is not so open to adapt it immediately. So, you know, it's, it's, a, big, it's a big dialogue. So, uh, I see academia as providing these products, this knowledge, uh, and then eventually being adopted by government. Another example is our Lagundi. Lagundi is a very good example. It's been around for a long time. Lagundi is a product of UP Manila. Sambong is a product of uh, UP Manila. So, but we have to support the researchers who are doing the research on plants. We should support the ones uh, doing the research on diagnostics and on treatment and all the trials of new drugs. So, so long as health is a concern, and it will always be a concern, then UP Manila is going to be relevant to the ordinary Filipino. With the many lessons that you've learned in your life, what would you like to uh, tell the youth? Uh, well, one, I, um, when, I, when I look back at my life, uh, yes, I was sure about being a doctor, Yes, I was sure about wanting to become a pediatrician, but genetics was never part of my dream. I was once young, and uh, I, I sort of like had my own set of dreams. You know, I wanted this and that, and I thought that you know it's one straight road. But what I learned with uh, the decision in genetics is that these detours will happen in life. So I. I so long as you have the support from your family and your, your mentors, we should consider taking these detours because you never know where the, the detour will lead you. So this genetics was a detour for me, but if not for that detour, then the country will not have newborn screening. The other detour in my life really is um, the Genome Center. I mean, I did not really plan to become an executive director, but it fell on my lap. And, um, but that one uh, came at a time where in maybe genetics was more mature, but if I did not take up the challenge, then, then we don't have a genome center with two buildings right now. That was one detour quite later in my life, but I, I, now I realize there are too many detours in life. What is important is that when you make that decision, you have discussed it with your family, you have discussed it with your colleagues. It's not just mentors at this point. You know, I discuss it with my peers because there are so many factors that will contribute to the success. Each of the offices I have set up at this point, because I have set up quite a number of offices, uh, starting from Ognay ng Pahinungod, Institute of Human Genetics, the Newborn Screening Reference Center, the Genome Center, and so on. There will always be many challenges, but it's the way you will look at challenges. Uh, the way I see it is that there will always be a solution, but it's the way you will look at the solution. Is it a solution that you, you want, or it may be a solution that you're not even interested in, but then you have no choice. So, so, so that has been my life. I, I take in these challenges as spice in my life, in my work. Because there's not a single project that I, handle, that I handled without these challenges and these frustrations and, and so on. 
Um, the other thing I, um, maybe that's, this is one I, I usually tell my, especially my son, I tell him, you've got to look beyond when you think of a decision. Um, it's not about me, but it's really about, about whom? It doesn't have to be the country. It just so happened in my case, it was the country. But it can be my, my department, it can be my college, it can be my university, it can be my society. It just so happened that I stumbled into a project that eventually was, you know, reached the whole country, but I did not plan it that way. So I think, you know, one should not be scared about trying new things. One should not be scared if um, things don't go on the way you planned it. The important thing is that you've got to be focused until the very end. So if you say that this is the end point, my goal is fixed. It may be changed a little, but the goal is definite. One thing I've learned in life is that um, when it's not about you, when it's about other people, it's really easy to work, you know. It's, um, I find it so much comfortable for me when I talk about how it will serve the country, because I think at the end of the day, that's what we in UP are meant for. So I really enjoyed my stay in the academe. I, uh, if I had the choice, I still want to work in the academe. At this late age, I've been offered many positions, but if I had the choice, I still want to stay in the academe because I think regardless of age, I think the academe uh, will have a place for new ideas. It's not about being young or middle age or old age. I see the value of people in post-retirement having new ideas, but the academe, so long as it's open and willing to take you in, then it will be a, a place to cultivate ideas. The young has so much to offer, and I think um, I see a bright future for the country, and we in the university, in administration, should make sure that our next generation will feel good about staying in the Philippines and working in the university. Let's talk about Carmen Sita Padilla, your persona. Who are you? What makes Chancellor Carmen Sita Padilla wake up energized every morning? You know, when I start the day and I know that I have a long list of uh, problems and meetings uh, beyond eight hours, I, I started with a very optimistic day. I really say a little prayer to thank that I have a new day again and I ask for guidance. You know, I, I believe in um, uh, spiritual guidance, you know, for me to hurdle the many challenges. I have many problems as a chancellor, but I... I'd like to believe that you know there's a solution for everything. The solution is not always what I want, but there is a solution to every case. I, um, when people have asked me why, I, um, I think that's the way I was really, that's how I grew up. And that's why when, I, when they gave me that gumamela in my name, uh, Hibiscus Carmencita David Padilla. That was the name of my gumamela. And I was asking them, why give me a red gumamela? And they said, because they, they saw a lot of optimism, and that was uh, the one that's being uh, represented by the red color. And, um, but I think, you know, it's the optimism in me that helped me push forward every day. And, uh, and my days are long. You know, I... Practically, when I go home, if I don't have a meeting at night, I start another day for my other advocacies because I have a long list of advocacies that I can only do after I finish my official work. So um, I'm not easily uh, uh, broken down. I think you know I've got enough personal issues in my life wherein I've I've grown to be strong. I've learned that. Uh, Many of the things you pray for don't happen, so you just have to accept what has been given to you because that's the best for you. I believe in team, team effort, and whatever I've accomplished up to this point is really uh, because of the very strong team effort within UP Manila. 
I probably have that skill on how to deal with very difficult people because I have very difficult people that I have to face with, whether in the university or in any of the agencies. But somehow I've, I know how to win them on my side. And uh, since they know that whatever I'm working for or fighting for has nothing to do but with me, has nothing to do at all with me, but for the benefit of a bigger community, then it's so easy to convince the people I work with. I enjoy my, I, I've enjoyed my life. I've enjoyed uh, my life as a researcher, as a clinician, and uh, now as a chancellor. I, uh, time is so fast, I have not realized that, uh, uh, you know, my days are counted and that you never know when the day will end. So as, as, a, as an ending, I always tell my colleagues that if you want your ideas to continue beyond your life, you better start working on succession.